Welcome to Taking Care of Business on News Talk 1180 KERN for the best in Saturday talk radio at 1 o'clock, 1230 KGEO at 10 o'clock Saturday, and for the best in Wednesday talk radio on 1410 KERI, the Christian station. We're now on 1000 KKIM in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and three times a week on the Internet nationwide through KNookMedia.com. Plus, you can catch any of our shows for the last four years at the Clay and Marty Show. Your host is Clay Kerner, and I'm Marty Pay, and our producer is Greg Held. Hey, Greg, that was a or Clay. That was a great show last week with uh, Kathy and Mark Abernathy. Well, that's a personal opinion, you know. <laughs> sometimes we had good results, sometimes we had bad. Well, that one I thought was a, an excellent show, uh, talking about the election results. We've got a great show today. Actually, we we were uh, dubbing this the Wally and Wally Show. It just worked out that way. Our guest in the second half is uh, Wally Amos from Famous Amos Cookies. He's going to talk about some ventures he's got going on. But in the first half, we have uh, one of my very favorite guests, <coughs> Dr. Wally Ferris, to talk about the Middle East. Dr. Ferris, welcome back to taking care of business. Yeah. Ah, you still there? Hello, Dr. Ferris, how are you? Yes, I'm good. How about you? Good. You know, your books are right on. That Lost Spring is just perfect. I mean, it really talks about what's going on. You, you're, you're a great prognosticator, unfortunately. Unfortunately, that's, that's what's happening. And unfortunately, my book, The Lost Spring, doesn't even you know, compare to the next book, which is going to be about the actual catastrophes that occurred. You know, my, the subtitle of my book, which I published early this year, uh, the title of The Lost Spring, U.S. Foreign Policy in the Middle East, and Catastrophes to Avoid. Now, between then and now, with ISIS, with Iran, with Yemen, with Libya, the catastrophes are here. So this is going to give me material, unfortunately, as you say, for my next book. Yes, uh, definitely, unfortunately. You know, I, I wanted to start out with something that I saw you had posted that got my curiosity up. You were talking about an Intel memo. Uh, this this idiot in, in New York, the, the axe attacker, uh, yes. how he had this obsession with, uh, with uh, ISIS and radical Islam. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, now, unfortunately, we are discovering that these individual jihadist lone wolves or operating alone is the same thing practically. The, these individuals are all inspired by one ideology. You know, every case is not inventing a new ideology. It's the same, with the same goals. So now the question, uh, multiple questions, question number one is, where are they getting this ideology? Because it's a one set of ideas, and it has, of course, one set of networks that is promoting it. So it is organized. It's not just individual frustration with issues. It's actually organized. So my first question has been, who is organizing it, online, offline? But the second more uh, critical question is, why aren't we seeing it? Why are we seeing these issues only months and sometimes later, you know, years later? So there's a force that is obstructing the public, the government, from seeing this. And I gave the example in New York. In the police uh, department in New York had a, an excellent counter-jihadi or counter-terrorism department. And the goal of that department was to detect this ideological radicalization. It has been removed. Why was it removed? Because once it was removed, then lone wolves or jihadi working alone, we cannot detect them early. It's like in medical science, you know, detecting cancer early is more important than, than dealing with it later. Okay, so, I mean, are they just going after these individuals that, you know, that, that are mentally deranged and, 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 and trying to somehow target them so they could use them? I mean, it's a, it's a subtle way to pick up a an army uh, basically without having to do anything. That's not really new. Uh, even uh, radical forces in the 60s and the 70s, I remember from my days in the Middle East, they would basically uh, target the weak, what they call the weakest, most receptive segment in a society. They would go to villages, uh, the, the, the communists at the time or the Syrian nationalists at the time in, in my home country, Lebanon, but also in Syria and other places. And they would target those marginal elements, and they would empower them with an ideology. And the ideology will be seen by these individuals as their personal empowerment. But without the ideology, this cannot happen, because they need, these individuals need to see a systematic global uh, vision of the world, which is provided by these radicals. So now, yes, you're right. The jihadi indoctrinators, I call them indoctrinators, they do target those, but they don't have to make a huge effort. What they do is they release the ideology. And that, it's like a cloud. It could 
catch anybody. It could catch somebody who's very sophisticated, less sophisticated, on and on. And then you had those individuals who would commit these uh, these acts. It's, it's, it's just crazy. It's insane. Uh, you also mentioned something that I no- noticed about U.S. citizens are, are uh, striking back and trying to sue the banks that are helping Iran. What's that all about? Well, you know, the Iranian regime through Hezbollah and through other uh, organizations uh, have been responsible for for the killing of many, you know, first of all, soldiers and marines in Lebanon in 1983 and after that in Iraq and hostages. So the families of these victims in the United States to begin with are actually suing for, you know, to get to get remuneration or to get uh, money from the banks which basically have forwarded money to the Iranian regime. What, what I was drawing the attention of, of listeners or viewers or, you know, uh, readers to is that while this is happening, the United States administration is transferring, one, has transferred $1 billion to the Iranian regime. Now, look at the contradiction. On the one hand, we have families going after the Iranian regime and banks for that purpose, and our own administration under the ages of uh, the Iranian nuclear interim deal are, have sent cash to, to Iran. So Congress needs to adjust the situation. We cannot send cash, we cannot send money to a regime that is identified by our own laws as a terrorist regime. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. We're having a conversation with Dr. Mm-hmm. Wally Ferris, consultant to Congress and the European uh, Union, and he's also the author of a great, great book called The Lost Spring. You know, Dr. Ferris, you're from the Middle East. Maybe you can help me understand the comment that Islam is a religion of peace. You want me to do this in less than a couple minutes? <laughs> there is a, this whole debate about, uh, you know, this, this is too uh, oversimplifying. Uh, and, of course, this is for the purpose of public relations. It was it was invented in the past administration and in all administrations, and it's also by interfaith uh, coalition. I mean, any religion, you could describe it as, you know, for peace and not for, for war. But let's look at the reality of the debate. The debate, the real debate, the theological debate, is that are there texts and verses inside the, 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 the theology of Islam or the various texts of Islam, whereby there is a call for, I don't want to say for violence, for war. Is there a code, a military code inside? And in fact, there is. So now it, it's really up to government to engage in the theological debate or not, because I have been always critical or opposed to the idea of having a government saying that this religion is good, this religion is not good. Because if you say that Islam is about peace, so what about Judaism and Christianity and Taoism? We are not in the business as government, secular government, in defining religions. That's a theological debate. So I would say I am not going to enter the fray of a debate on national security that has to do with theology. That would be my, my approach to it. Well, we do, need, we do need government to get out of religion, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, people are suing for, you know, Christmas decoration in public uh, you know, squares. Christmas decoration, a, a tree. That's how far we went in terms of the, our secular culture. And then you have the president going to Cairo and quoting from religious texts. Should it be the Quran or the Bible? Doesn't matter. So we need to adjust that again. We need to be logical with, are we a secular government that intervenes in, in theological issues, or we're not? If we're not, then we don't have to define what is Islam or Judaism or Christianity. Well, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed when I hear President Obama talk about the, the Muslim basis to our country and how, you know, it was so important in the founding of our nation. I don't see it th- anywhere. I, I've, I've written a book on the subject myself years ago, and I don't see anything uh, involved with anything other than the Judeo-Christian ethic in our society. Look, it's all about politics and policies. If the president wants to include a, a Muslim heritage, then he has to open the whole gate. He has to include every other heritage. He has to include the Hindu, the Taoist. He has to include, even within Christianity, the various... It won't end. This is another slippery road. If you are going to begin to find links between theologies and a secular government, then the government can, can be deemed as, as secular. Then, then new balances of powers in the future will, will say, well, this government has more Orthodox than Protestant and Calvinist than the Islamic. It is not. It's the wrong direction, in yeah, my view. I, I totally agree. When we come back from the break, let's talk a little bit about uh, Obama's strategy and how it's uh, affecting ISIS. We'll be back in a moment on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio News Talk 1180. 